The management of severe asthma has been revolutionised recently by the advent of biologics or monoclonal antibodies targeting specific mediators of asthma. These are now routinely used in many countries around the world as part of treatment protocols, but they are expensive, so it's important to ensure that the right drug is given to the right patient. But how do you know whether prescribing them will be beneficial? We investigate. This is Euphoria News, broadcasting from London. Hello and welcome to Euphoria News. I'm Dr. David Bull. Around 5 to 10% of the total asthmatic population suffers from severe or uncontrolled asthma, which is associated with increased mortality, hospitalization, an increased healthcare burden, and a worse quality of life. Now, over the last few years, a therapy with biologics has revolutionized the management of these cases in adults and adolescents. These medications are mostly directed against molecules involved in the type 2 inflammatory pathway and, as a result, they reduce airways inflammation. To date, five biologic molecules have been officially approved for use in selected severe asthmatic patients in most countries. Omalizumab is an anti-IgE monoclonal antibody. Three more biologics belong to a different class. These are mepolizumab, resolizumab and benralizumab. They all target the interleukin-5 or IL-5 pathway. And finally, dupilumab works against the interleukin-4 or IL-4 receptor, blocking the signaling pathways of IL-4 and IL-13. The major challenge of biologics remains the prediction of success in severe asthma and the choice of the right biologic for the right patient. So first of all, we will hear from the paediatric point of view and then from the adult perspective by hearing from two experts of the Euphoria Asthma Expert Panel. First of all, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Milos Jezenak. He is Professor of Paediatrics at the Jacinius Faculty of Medicine at Comenius University in Slovakia. Very good to see you, Professor. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining me. Now, I've already outlined the different types of biologics that are available. So tell me, what is the situation with regards to adolescent patients with asthma? Well, uh... Regarding the biologics, it's quite interesting because we have several differences between the different age categories. And for adolescents, but also this is valid for the children older than six years, depending on the, on the type of the biologics. Still, we should think before the indication of the biologics to see the whole young man or young, young adolescent in his complexity. So before the indication of biologics and before the use, since we are taking into consideration that probably this will be long-term treatment, even maybe lifetime. So we just start, start trying to see all the other aspects, not only the asthma, but also the comorbidities, the type of the patients, the possible compliance and adherence to the treatment, the collaboration of the patients with us. We should exclude all the other things which can complicate uh, the way uh, to achieve the control over the asthma. And by exclusion, all the other a complication, all the other background diseases, then we can start about the thinking to start the treatment of biologics. We know that there are some differences between the molecules and between the preparation, especially regarding the mode of application, frequency of application, and also the possibility of home use. I mean, you speak very eloquently there about making sure that actually you look at the patient as a whole. So are there specific clinical presentations that you look for uh, when you're actually determining whether uh, the, the young person should be put on biologics? Besides the clinical symptoms and clinical problems, we should be taking into account, especially in the young people, we're just trying to evaluate the whole impact of bronchial asthma and the symptoms of bronchial asthma on all the daily activities, not only uh, during the effort, during the school, but also during the free time activities, during the social life of young men. But uh, uh, before the indication of biologics, we should just try to optimize all the other treatment like uh, inhalation therapy, the possibilities, for example, for allergen immunotherapy, since we know that in some of the allergic forms of asthma, we should try even the, the indication for allergen immunotherapy. 
So, so just in terms of, of each individual patient, are there specific clinical presentations to look for or indeed biomarkers that would allow you to sort of understand and predict success of biologics in adolescents with asthma? We can also predict the possible response to particular biologic treatment. For example, if there is very high pheno, we can predict very good responsivity to dupilumab. If there is very high eosinophilia, this will be optimal patients, for example, for, for mepolizumab. In case that there is a clear Ig-mediated bronchial asthma, in this case, we can hardly think about the possibility of uh, ovalizumab, which are the most important biologics useful for adolescents. So given everything that you've said, uh, in your experience, what sort of percentage of your severe asthma patients do you think would be candidates for biologics? Well, uh, this is quite interesting because the data for severe asthma in general are not so so good reported in children and adolescents compared to adults. But basically from all the asthmatics, we can predict that approximately 3 to 5% of all the asthmatics can be indicated for severe asthma treatment with biologics. Of course, before indication of the biologics, we should optimize all the other possibilities of the treatment, like inhalation therapy, some other medicaments which are applied in peral form. So finally, perhaps I could ask you, what do you predict as being the future of biological care for asthma in the pediatric population? Well, Currently, we see that uh, after the era of achievement of control over the asthma, currently we see another aim or another goal, which is the induction of long-term remission. And I think this will be the, the key for biologics. So therefore, I can predict that in the future, one thing, we will see some new biologics, some new molecules, maybe aimed on some different targets then we will maybe see more data for especially children between the 6 to 11 years, because currently we have only two possibilities for the asthma treatment there with biologics. And uh, I, can I can suppose that maybe in the future, the indication of biologics maybe in childhood, in adolescent, uh, will be a little bit sooner. Not only in the severe forms, but maybe on the moderate forms of asthma. And maybe this will be the, the solution for, for the duration of the treatment of biologics. Well, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Milos Zezenak. Thank you for your invitation. Well, joining me now from Copenhagen is Professor Vibeka Bakker. She is the Chief Respiratory Physician in the Department of ENT and the Centre for Physical Activity Research at Rings Hospitalet in Copenhagen in Denmark. She is also a Euphoria Asthma Expert Panel Member. Very good to see you. Professor, now I've just been talking to Professor Jezenak about the role of biologics in severe asthma in adolescents. And I think it's fair to say they've really changed outcomes significantly, haven't they? Yeah, they have. Um, you can say, first of all, it's only a minority of the asthma patients which is having severe asthma. But those who are having severe asthma, they have lots of symptoms. And it is a, a huge uh health burden to the society and to themselves, of course. So going from uh, a large dosage of inhaled uh, as an anti-asthma medication and systemic steroids to the biologics uh, has changed a lot for the patients and from us as a clinicians. So tell me, how would you make that clinical decision? How do you decide which bi biologic to use for which patient? What sort of clinical criteria do you look for to help make that decision? But, but that's a very difficult uh, question to answer because uh, mostly it will be based on what the authorities, the medical authorities uh, are allowing us to use. So if, if it was a buffet where we could just choose, we have to be more specific by uh, the endotypes and be more uh, aware of um, which drug would be the best. Although there's no um, biomarkers uh, yet to use, yet to find out which will be the best. Um, so, so in many countries, it will be the medical authorities who will decide which drug you should start with and the second in row will you know, is told 
uh, to us as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes it makes perfect sense. So essentially, you're given an algorithm. You have to do what the medical authorities say. Just just you mentioned there about biomarkers. Are there none at all that you can rely on in terms of trying to predict success about using these biological treatments? But here you have to understand to to make that decision, you will need head to head studies where you compare in the same group of patients, you compare one of the other or one of the third or the fourth in between, but that kind of studies are not there. The decision compare the decision of which one of the uh, the fourth biologic is very difficult because uh, those studies are not there. So let me just ask you this then, if patients come to you and present to you with comorbidities, does that impact what you do? Does that drive the choice for choosing one or the other biological? I think one of the one of the things which will uh, make me to choose differently compared to what the authorities have told us would be if it is a severe allergic asthma, for example. The severe allergic asthma will benefit more with omelizumab than with one of the other ones. So that's the choice, and that's a biomarker. Allergy is a biomarker as well. So, so there we can choose. But among the other ones, we do not choose in our everyday life. So finally, perhaps I could just ask you, where do you see the future lying uh, in terms of the use of biologics, the rolling out of more of these, uh, these drugs uh, and the impact on patient care? I think it's very important to say to the pharmaceutical companies out there, we, we really want to have head-to-head -head comparison studies because if we could have head-to-head -head studies, which means that we have studies where we randomize to one or the other type of drug, we will then know which biomarker will be the best for the specific treatment. Well, it's, it's a great thought to finish on. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Professor Rebecca Backer. Thank you. Well, that's it for this Euphoria News. Many thanks to my guests, to Professor Milos Jezenak and Professor Vibeka Bakker. Now you can find more information about Euphoria and register for the Euphoria educational events on the euphoria.eu website, where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. And don't forget to follow us on social media on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. Until next time, goodbye.